Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Damaris Mukulu, and I'm the Marketing Manager at Genghis Capital. This is the inaugural edition of the Genghis Monthly Financial Chats, and we aim to have regular conversations on the development in the financial markets. We're very glad you are able to join us today. I'd like to introduce you to the Financial Chats host. His name is Kevin Ginge. Kevin is an equities dealer with the Jenga Securities Department and loves all things investments. So from cryptocurrencies to global stocks and our local financial markets, he's the man you want to talk to. His guest for today's chat is Chachi Logutu, who is the head of research at Jenga's Capital. Chachi and his team launched the Jenga's Playbook um, in January, January 19, 2021. And the theme of the playbook was navigating the now normal. Now, the playbook gave institutional and retail investors a view of what the year would hold in terms of equities, fixed income, and microeconomic outlook for the year. We are back today to see how these expectations are panning out and to review the performance of the Genghis model stock portfolio. Yes. The recording of this webinar will be available on the Genghis YouTube channel, so be sure to visit and subscribe to get an alert once we upload it. You'll also find other useful videos on our channel covering a variety of topics and investment products. And as well as being an attendee, you will receive an email next week with a direct link to the recording. We'd love to hear from you, so please feel free to use the Q&A section of the Zoom tab to send in any questions you may have. And you can also use the chat function for any comments or concerns you're having during the session. At the end of this webinar, we'll also ask you to fill in a very short survey if you have a moment to spare, and this will help us to improve our future webinars. If you're on social media and you want to continue this conversation after this webinar, perhaps you come across a conversation topic you'd like us to discuss, or you have another question you'd like us to uh, deal with, feel free to use the hashtag Genghis Financial Chats. Once again, welcome to the Genghis Monthly Financial Chats and over to you, Kevin Ginger, to start us off. Thank you. Today's going to be short and sweet. So we're just going to look at the uh, uh, portfolios we had highlighted to you early in the week in the Genghis playbook. So the portfolios are one that run a whole year, but we wanted to do sort of a preview for Q1, uh, having gone through the full almost three month cycle of the uh, pandemic for the year. So with me again, it's Chachi Logutu, head of research, and uh, the guys primarily who set up the playbook for you. So I'm going to share my screen just now. We had three portfolios uh, that we actively track for the year. So we have the momentum stocks. And uh, from my understanding, these are the most liquid stocks that we have. So when you're looking about liquidity, we look about active day trading. We look about foreign participation. As you all might be aware, our market is over 75% uh, foreign driven. So whatever stocks the foreigners tend to uh, actively participate in, it uh, sort of uh, tend to be replicated here by the local uh, institutional and uh, individual investors. So our momentum stocks are our top blue chip stocks that actively trade on a day-to-day -day basis. So underneath there, you can see we have the equity groups, you have the EABL, you have the KCB group, and you have Safaricom. So what, again, uh, 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 we look at when you're looking at uh, these momentum stocks is uh, what you call the return. And you can see uh, if you come to the uh, further right, you can see the return on equity. So for instance, our equity group uh, had 16.2% return on equity over that period, uh, EABL 63.3%, KCB 12.7% and Safaricom 49%. Uh, Understandably uh, so, Safaricom is the biggest, again, uh, actively traded stock. It accounts for over 56% of all traded uh, shares under the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Uh, just to put it into perspective, Safaricom is bigger than the net 64 uh, listed equity or listed shares. So you can understand as to why um, it would be the most actively traded. When you come to the income stocks, uh, predominantly what we look at under the income stocks is uh, the dividend yield. So these are the companies that have a stable, solid uh, dividend history over the last uh, couple of years. For instance, ABSA is well known for its dividend deal that at times uh, uh, averages at around 9%, you know, Kenya Re and a few others that are not even here, but these are the top when it comes to uh, income uh, stocks. So basically we track the dividend yield. The reason you might not be seeing it there is uh, we didn't foresee most of these companies declaring a dividend under the full pandemic. So, but that's what we usually use on the background to calculate um, uh, our, our income stocks. Uh, maybe here I can let in Churchill uh, to shed a word or two regarding the momentum. 
and uh, the income stocks, Churchill. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, it's a privilege to be your guest, or the first guest. So just a commentary on uh, the momentum and the income stocks. Uh, yes, put well um, from your end. Uh, these are highly liquid stocks. Uh, this particularly for the momentum and also the foreign interest is quite heavy on these stocks. And uh, a key for even the recommendations that we have, you can see that we have buys on the banks, that's equity, uh, KCB group, and also EABL uh, and Safaricom is on hold. So what we, what is usually our guiding principle is that anything that has an upside above 15%, uh, we put it as, as a buy. Uh, between 15% to a negative 15%, uh, that's on hold. And anything uh, greater than a downside of 15%, that's an outright sell. So that's our, usually our guiding principle and uh, that also played out even with the ratings in, uh, that you can see in the momentum stocks and also in the income stocks uh, they are about here. Yeah. So maybe another... just, uh, sorry, Churchill, maybe just to uh, to make sure everyone understands that we're in the same page when it's yeah. talking about uh, 15 percent, you know, lower than 15 percent between 15 and whatever and above, whatever you just say, maybe look at those uh, numbers again. Is are you looking at the upside? So, are you looking at the price vis a vis our target price? Or are we looking at return on equity? What exactly are we looking at? Oh, you say, uh, oh thanks, thanks for taking me back. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the upside actually is now the target price that we have and also the market price at that point. So, the the fourth column uh, where it's been written upside. So those values are derived from uh, the target price, the service, the market price, and then you can get those values that are there. 20.9% uh, in equity, for example, and then on Safaricom, uh, and downside of 6.5% from uh, the market price. Uh, say for Safaricom, the market price that time was 35 shillings, and we had a target price of 30 two shillings and 72 cents. So the downside is 6.5%, 6, 6 uh, hence it's a whole. So between 15% uh, upside to 15% downside, that's a whole. Anything above 15% upside, it's a, it's a buy. Anything greater than 15% uh, downside, it's a sell. So that's, those are the guiding principles to our recommendations. Yeah, okay. and uh, uh, before, before uh, before we continue, let me just mention some of the weightings because we have also obviously weighted our portfolio. And just based on the downside on Safaricom, just based on the target price that we had, uh, we have uh, for on in the momentum portfolio, our weighting to Safaricom is 19%. Obviously, uh, Kevin has alluded to the fact that Safaricom is quite uh, heavy on the total market cap, so we are underweight. Uh, what you call under which the uh, market right now is around uh, 51 55 percent, uh, thereabouts. But in our momentum portfolio, we are underweight at 19 percent. But for the other uh counters, uh, PPT, we are at around 13 percent on the momentum portfolio. Uh, KCB is around uh, 26 percent on the momentum portfolio. So, for a hypothetical investor who is investing a hundred thousand. So you could have an allocation of 19,000 to Safaricom, uh, 13,000 to equity, and another 26,000 to KCB. The lion's share <coughs> in the momentum portfolio is now on EABL, which is around 36,000 for every 100,000 that an investor is sharing, is investing into. And then we have like a 5% allocation to cash. So I think, let me just take it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Churchill. Um, so I, I think I covered it pretty well on the momentum on the income stocks. Uh, maybe we want to understand. So we already talked about momentum and basically mentioned and touched on liquidity, uh, availability. Um, so then we have our value stocks. Maybe you can take uh, a yes, yeah, so for the value stocks, we're looking at uh, the counters that uh, are priced discount against their fundamentals. Uh, this is even looking at uh, their, their ratios on, on, on the second last and the last uh, column on that uh, portfolio. 
whereby we have a price to book uh, ratio. Ideally, these stocks, uh, if you compare with their industry average, they are at, at, at price at a discount, uh, for instance. So if you look at, say, Kenya, for, for example, uh, in the insurance in, in, in the industry, you find that it's a price to book of 0.2% is at a discount to the insurance average. So those are the, those are the dynamics that you look at, uh, include, including the counters into the value portfolio. And of course, there is also the potential for higher return uh, that is also looked at uh, from the upside that we are seeing based on the target price that we have and also the market price at that particular point where all of them are way above the 15% threshold on, on the upside. So those are the uh, type of rules that you put in consideration for any stocks that has to get into the value portfolio. I mean, it's uh, it's good you mentioned uh, some of those names, especially for Kenya when you're looking at the insurance space. And I'm sure most of our clients or customers would want to understand is, um, especially looking at fundamentals and I very much maybe want to comment about uh, Kenya Re and maybe Churchill can talk about uh, Kenjan or EABL is that uh, when you're looking at insurance, most, if not all of our insurance uh, names are really undervalued. I think Churchill alluded to that. We have an insurance uh, penetration rate of around 2.2%. Uh, that's against uh, uh, an African average of 0.8%. So we might look like uh, we are well above average. But then again, we, uh, as compared uh, in the South, we are really looking grim. So for instance, South Africa has a penetration rate of around 14.9%. You know. If you look at Botswana, we're talking around 7.9%. When you look at Namibia, we're talking north of 6.5%. So again, we really have, uh, uh, I mean, we have the whole world above us in terms of penetration. And uh, the Kenyan market has really been doing a couple of things. We've seen a couple of regulations being introduced to ensure that um, this industry that is, uh, if I may use the words over-insured, we, we have around 66 insurance uh, players but then our, our insurance penetration is only 2.2%. So as with the banking space, we expect to see a, a couple of consolidations or mergers and acquisitions in the insurance space. Um, we, we know the top top three. So we've seen Kenya Re, we've seen uh, Jubilee, and these are names we, we talk about in our weekly briefings. We've seen Britam, we've seen what has just happened to Britam, and we're trying to cut in terms of uh, staff costs. Um, trying to consolidate their business, their regional business. So yes, uh, from from a fundamental view, if you look at Kenya, I mean, it's really cheap, which leads to it's really undervalued. And as with most of the uh, couple of names of an insurance space, Churchill, we saw something regarding Kenjan. Uh, we saw their numbers. Maybe you don't comment on that. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, we saw the. First half for the current financial year, it's a financial year starts uh, from July 1st. It's similar to the government of Kenya's financial year, 1st of July up until June of thir June 30th, uh, this current financial year. So the numbers were from July to June period, uh, whereby we had a, a profit after tax of 5 billion. Uh, it had a, like an earnings per share. So we know that people get into stocks uh, to 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 get the at least they are, they have an ownership stake and also just looking at the earnings from that particular counter. So for earnings per share, so we are looking at uh, seven seven cents on Kenjan. So it it was quite decent. It wasn't as uh, it it had come down from the prior uh, first half numbers, but still never nonetheless it was quite decent. What we're looking at primarily, we we, we saw a dip slightly on the revenue numbers uh, slightly, but now there was those, uh, uh, the net returns, net revenue was slightly better than it was expected. So those are some of the things. And we think that Kenjan has been quite uh, looking at other alternative revenue streams. Uh, it has uh, uh, that uh, contract with the Ethiopia, South Sudan uh, to supply uh, the, it has some, drilling uh, rights over there, at least for the ge geothermal. So those are some of the alternative uh, revenue streams that is uh, bolstering uh, Kenjan. And in our view, I think that it's, it's, it's quite, uh, in the long term, uh, it could be able to harness value, uh, which you could see even decent uh, earnings for shareholders on the counter. 
And maybe just to confirm, is it that Kenjan always uh, repay their capex in full? I'll have yeah. to yeah yeah I'll have to check that, but I know that uh, it's usually a repeat. Uh, they usually come in to 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 get uh, the the debt. Uh, for their long-term projects uh, mainly they look at the bilateral loans from uh, the japanese issuers so we, we, and co because of their their huge capex demands so we find that uh, it, at any given point it has uh, outstanding debt on its on its book all right no worries we can revisit that later on so maybe uh, something on our clients would be asking is we've already showed the momentum uh, our three uh, model portfolio that's the momentum income and value and these were prices pegged on our playbook building uh, during the launch in uh, january vis-a-vis uh, -vis the target price so maybe the next slide could now show the market price i believe as of, as at yesterday um and as we can see equity group from our previous um when we were starting to put uh, this playbook together the price on equity was at 6.1 and that's the, just the first count on, under the momentum. And now the price has uh, rallied to that 7.85. So you can see that also affects uh, the potential upside. But, but maybe instead of looking at uh, the individual, we can just look at, at the overall, which is the weighted average. So initially, I believe we had around 17.7%. Uh, we have seen that uh, come down to 12.2%. If you're looking at uh, the income stocks, I think we had around 21%. Uh, on average, under that portfolio, that has gone up to 26.18%. And I believe the last one on the value stocks, uh, we had 31.2%, that has gone up to 38.24%. And just basically, thanks to all the things that we've been talking about, for instance, we saw Safaricom, and their first ever initial dividend. So that, of course, brought in some, uh, some rally. We as well saw Safaricom uh, getting more weighting under the MSCI uh, Africa Index, thanks to Kuwait being elevated up. So again, that's more waiting to Kenya. And when we're talking about waiting to Kenya for someone say seated in Miami, New York, or a fund manager in London, uh, predominantly we're talking about uh, visibility and most of that visibility goes to Safaricom. As we mentioned, it accounts for 56% of all traded uh, securities, or to put it in perspective, it's bigger than the next 64 counters uh, combined under the Nairobi Securities Exchange. So again, uh, Churchill mentioned, if you had 100,000, you where uh, you can then uh, actively track or we can help you with that uh, through our model portfolios, depending on your risk uh, and return ratio. So maybe we can proceed um, uh, to emerging themes. And this is where we are going to talk about, of course, earnings. Uh, we expect fully earnings to be coming right about anytime now. Uh, we've seen a couple of profit warnings from NMG to a couple of the banks. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We've, been, we've mentioned already trends on Safaricom. Uh, share buybacks, we've seen that uh, with NMG and just recently in the morning we've seen uh, Liberty, we also saw something on Stanbic and we've of course heard about the buyout of uh, Kabasid. So maybe we can just uh, briefly, Churchill, touch on the earnings season and maybe just compare um, how the half year numbers would uh, maybe uh, fare against the full year numbers, Churchill. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for that. Uh, just looking at uh, our expectations broadly, uh, there's, but in, mainly in the bank, in the banking sector, which we we, we cover uh, extensively, uh, there are some key themes that uh, are standing out. Uh, one, of course, is now the issue about the dividends uh, payments uh, for some of the income-oriented investors, not only on the call but even out there. Uh, what happened and what we saw in the banking sector uh, over the course of the half year numbers and also the three Q numbers, does that elevated provisioning uh, by the banks, at least to cushion against uh, the loans which might uh, go toxic or might uh, deteriorate. So there's that kind of uh, cautiousness amongst the banking sector. And uh, that also speaks to the fact that even it, it eats into the net income. So obviously, and tied to the second uh, aspect about the profit warnings, we've had a number of the banks now coming out and uh, saying that, uh, coming out to give their profit warnings for full year 2020. And that's a theme that is broadly, uh, if you could now pinpoint the banking sector is something that is dominating. And our view was, Initially, we had the view that uh, the dividends will be either be eliminated entirely 
amongst the banking sector, or there could be a re reduction in dividend. So that is something that uh, we expect to play out. Uh, we've seen the numbers coming out uh, today. I haven't seen it extensively, but I think they have announced a dividend uh, announcement, uh, final dividend. I need to see whether it's uh, how it fares with the previous dividend that was paid out last year. But my hunch is that it's quite lower than it was there uh, last year. Uh, so over the course of the next uh, two to three weeks, we expect that the other banks will start uh, issuing their earnings. Uh, I know KCB will be mid-March. Uh, uh, equity there about also the same time and also for cooperative around the same time. So, and we expect other uh, banks, uh, the listed ones, NCBA, Diamond Trust Bank, uh, also to release the announce uh, their full year 2020 results uh, just before the end of the month and similar to the insurance sector. So, right, it's a beehive of activity in terms of the earnings season. So I don't know what's your expectations, Kevin. I mean, you just mentioned something also on the banks, and I remember looking at a report, I think it was uh, one or two weeks ago, and uh, they were talking about over 57% of the loan book uh, fell into non, as, as a non-performing loan. Uh, well, some, some businesses, it's, it's as if we're getting uh, to the next normal, and uh, we could see I mean, there's traffic on the roads, uh, guys are almost getting back to work or at least have a, a schedule of how some will be at work, some will work from home. Uh, petrol stations are now filled with cars. Uh, I, I mean, it's, we, we're slowly getting on to the next normal and I believe the president will be talking today, uh, giving the measures maybe for the uh, guidance on, on, on the way forward. Are we going to have the curfew lifted? Are we going to have a, an extension of the hours? Uh, I mean, that's that's left to the state. So, yeah, is yeah. it right? Uh, is, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, uh, and what is also playing out is uh, this issue about the restructured loans. Remember that there was that uh, measure for to cushion borrowers uh, from uh, the adverse effect of COVID-19, and then at the end of the year, we saw numbers close to over 50% of that loan book had been restructured. So the worry is that if this COVID-19 uh, prolongs that restructured loan book could now turn toxic uh, as that's the main worry even from uh, market observers and also from the bank's perspective so it's something that uh, uh, people are keenly looking out uh, even in the full year 2020 numbers that may be that will be issued but then again is it when you talk about the loan book turning toxic is it in theory or is it practical for instance if cbk gave a guidance to uh, to, to extend that moratorium, say, for another one year until we get to the next normal, would, they, would the loan book then turn toxic or will it, will it still be in, uh, in, in, in fact, will it still be um, in a period where it, it, you cannot fully declare it as toxic because you have leeway from KCB or do you think it will outrightly turn toxic? Because I believe uh, what the banks, we foresee the banks to do is government is in an endless appetite for cash uh, banks will share away from learning to uh, MSME, uh, MSMEs uh, and just loan to that. Uh, we'll see most of our capital just going back to government debt. So do you believe it's something that in theory will then turn toxic or is it just a CBK play or is it actually erosion of real uh, assets? Yeah, uh, so um, let, to put it in reality or what might turn out because we're just looking at uh, scenarios but here is a doomsday scenario. Uh, whereby that uh, that relief period came to an end by that first of December, and we are seeing that uh, people had been given like a one year period at least to restructure their loans. By restructuring is that either you extend the term of the loan, or and also that means that uh, the repayment is quite lower. Looked at it from that perspective, so it's not entirely a moratorium whereby you're not completely not paying back your your loan uh, your loan so you're not servicing your loan as such uh, so what that means is that at the end of that term that you had negotiated with your bank comes to an end and in the event that the business environment still continues deteriorating what that means is that now that loan could now be put into that uh, is it the 90 day uh, time frame monitoring before now it starts being uh, considered a toxic loan 
So that's now the, the bolts and nuts on how uh, our restructured loan or the business was and business environment can now translate into uh, higher NPL ratios. I think for the sectors at the end of last year, we're looking at north of 14%, uh, which was quite elevated uh, as compared to pre COVID-19 level. So that is the, the negative bearish outlook that our market observers are, are, are looking at here. How it, how it pans out eventually, it's, uh, in, it's for us now to, to see uh, the trajectory of even uh, the response to COVID-19 and even how the businesses themselves and the individuals themselves bounce back from uh, COVID-19 fallouts. Okay, maybe just lastly on the, uh, before we leave the, uh, the talks on loans and bonds is, uh, you ask of my opinion, one, I don't foresee banks declaring uh, 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 fully a dividend. I don't see that coming. Maybe for stocks that government has significant holdings in, for instance, say KCB, you could see them surprise guys with, uh, with, with, with a dividend, you know. But for most guys and for most banks, I foresee um, guys trying to as much as possible uh, retain uh, uh, those earnings just, you know, for this period so that we at least don't see uh, banks closing or we don't see uh, more um, cost cutting measures like we've seen before, especially during the uh, uh, last year. But maybe just a question to each other. We recently saw that um, mobile loans are also being brought under the CBK net. Uh, what's your view on that? Uh, well, uh, what actually is happening in that from that development is that this this bill that uh, had initially been uh, had been tabled in Parliament, uh, there was a first reading on the bill uh, just to see on how these uh, the digital lenders or the credit only lenders can be put under the purview of CBK. Uh, so that uh, legislation piece of legislation was put out there sometime last year. But with the resumption of parliament, that was at the start of last month, they said that the outstanding bills totaling uh, around 50 of them that had been uh, had undergone the first reading, they need to go through the whole process for them to whether to be assented by the president or modified in between. So that's where we are. And that's where we are seeing that uh, uh, the mobile lenders, the credit only lenders could now be put under the purview of CBK. Of course, now that uh, introduces a whole ball game of uh, the dynamics in the banking sector uh, and how uh, ideally uh, the intent of bringing them to board is to ensure that this, this not predatory lending that we've been seeing from the credit only uh, sec segment, uh, the mobile lenders. So that is the, if I may look at the crux of the bill, that is what it's intended to do. So rather than uh, going into one of those uh, mobile lenders and then they charge you an exorbitant uh, rate of say 7% per month, you are now more or less within what the quote unquote traditional banking would lend it to you. So that's the purview of, of it. And it's, it, there's been some pushback uh, from the mobile uh, lenders. And we know the process between uh, these usually, the legislative process is a long process from the first reading. And then after that is now put out for the public participation and then it goes to the second reading. And then there's a, there's a whole uh, ball game of things, uh, moving parts that could even water down the original intent of the bill, or it could see some significant modifications of the bill. So at the moment, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's premature to tell uh, what ultimately will come out of it in, in my view, and just understanding on how this whole legislative process might take a protracted uh, period of time for it to come to fruition. All right, thank you very much. I think we've covered much of uh, the warnings. I think we've spoken uh, quite much about Safaricom. I don't know uh, how we're proceeding our moderator, uh, Damaris. Shall we continue? I think we're now at the share buybacks and some of the uh, newest, I think, uh, releases we've seen from NSC today was on Liberty. So uh, should we continue with that? Is there a question, moderator? 
Um, I think we're good to go, Kevin. There is one question that perhaps Churchill could elaborate on. Uh, during the momentum stock portfolios, you talked about the price to book ratio. Could either you or Kevin expand on that to help David Muhoro? Oh, let me go at it. Also, the price to book ratio is uh, is a metric that looks at the price, the market price of that counter as a percentage of uh, or against the, the net assets of the company. So the book value of the firm is ideally the net assets. So you look at the assets and then knock off the liabilities. So that portion of that is now uh, as a, as in terms of uh, that book value per share. So of course it will give you like a number in billion to look at it against uh, the shareholder, uh, the share, the number of shares to look at uh, the metric itself, to look at the book value per share, and then you compare it with the price. So the idea is that uh, by the metric itself does not give you, uh, it doesn't tell you anything but you compare it against peers, you can compare it against the sector. So if it's in a banking sector, say, for example, you're looking at KCB uh, is at 0 0.7 uh, times the price to book value. And then the, the industry, that's the banking sector is at 0 0.5 times the price to book value ratio. So for KCB, obviously slightly higher than the industry. So it's seen as uh, slightly overvalued against the peer industry. So the price to book metric is seen as a relative, you, you, you look at it on a relative basis. Uh, the counter itself that you're looking at and against the industry or against the comparable peers. So that's where you can derive the meanings against it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, David, hopefully that has clarified. And maybe, uh, Kevin, if you'll allow just one more question before you move on to the next segment. Uh, Joab is asking what you project Britam stock performance to be in the near future. I think this is probably in light of the news of this week. Um, yes, yes, must be in light uh, on the news of this week. And of course, we recently have uh, a new CEO, Mr. Tavaziva. Uh, Chabangi, if I got that right, it's not our tongue. Um, as I said, with all insurance, I was just recently looking at uh, the top insurance we have, and predominantly I was looking at Jubilee, Kenyary, and uh, and Britam. And the theme, the overall theme, is that as I mentioned earlier, all our insurance are undervalued. Um, I think they all have an upside of close to 100% from the analyst consensus. You know, if you look at all analysis made on these insurance companies and you just get an average, is uh, I think on average they have an, an upside potential of around 100%. Uh, for instance, I saw Kenya Re that's trading at around 2.3, uh, 2.4, has target values of north of five shillings. So that shows you the, the upside. Britam at seven shillings has uh, target prices of around 14 shillings, you know, and Jubilee, of course, uh, as well. So for me, Britam is, um, they have a solid, uh, solid control of, of, of Kenyan insurance market. Uh, we've seen, I think, their split of, uh, and life to life is around 53, 47. I know they're trying to work on it. I know they've tried to uh, offset some of their loss, uh, loss providing our uh, assets. So I think for me, all our insurance, we're going to see quite some traction on the insurance names. We know Britain, for instance, has a, a huge uh, equity port, uh, uh, portfolio and most of their stake is actually in equity banks. So of course, the performance of equity bank, the performance of the share, and we've seen it uh, on the earlier slides, even when we, when we just started our, our model uh, portfolios, we can see equity started at 6.1 towards the year, and we're now talking about that 7.85. So some of these gains will, of course, feed directly. I think it contributes uh, north of 24% to their bottom line. So I am all positive for insurance companies. I think, um, again, as I mentioned, um, if economies get to the next normal, so if we see things not going back to where we were, but getting to where we want them to get to, I think we are going to see, uh, based on products that these companies are issuing, and we've seen uh, 
uh, a, a new and rejuvenated Britain, despite the cost-cutting measures, which again, uh, when you look at it um, from an investor point of view, it goes to cutting costs. So for me, Britain is, as with all the insurance companies, uh, something I would want to keep an eye on, and I foresee uh, quite some traction there over the next one, two to three years. Yeah, Hi. and just to, just to piggyback on what Kevin has said, uh, we've had uh, from an analyst uh, group, we've had uh, so far last week we had a meeting with the management and also this week we had the management at least with the analysts in the industry. And what came out from the new CEO, uh, he, cause he was put to task uh, what is the outlook on the, the asset allocation? Because we see Britain is in the insurance sector, and then it has, uh, <coughs> sorry, this diversified, uh, you could think of it diversified investments, whereby it has it to, it's it to equity investments, that's equity group, and so HF. HF group and also the property development. So for the so he was being put to task because of the volatility, as Kevin has mentioned, in some of these uh, equity investments. <coughs> Sorry. So, but he said that uh, what he's looking at is uh, just to take a hard look at these equity investments and look at how they can be able to derive value uh, from the investments as opposed to just holding them as on a context of a legacy, uh, legacy issue. So it's from, the way I saw it, it's like uh, pointing out that uh, going forward, uh, either it could preempt uh, a skill down in the, those investments or just harnessing the value of having those investments under Britain. And tied to that and looking at uh, even the, what Kevin has said and the announcement that came uh, earlier on this week about uh, restructuring, but it's something that is more of, uh, if I look at it, Rather than looking at it from a business seg segment whereby there's a life, there's business insurance, there's a asset management. So we are moving from that kind of uh, organ organogram, but getting into the customer metric whereby it's now looking at retail, looking at the corporate clients, looking at uh, uh, the emerging consumers. So whether you are a retail client in say you have a life insurance policy with Britam and somebody who is a retail has uh, a product under asset management. So now you'll be lumped together into one. So it's moving from the customer metric, uh, functional metric approach that it is, but into customer centric metrics. Of course, there's a cost element to that in the short term, whereby some jobs will be lost. Uh, we are seeing uh, it will cost around 600 to 700 million. But now the savings that will come out of that or what will be realized from that kind of a shift is what will also dictate how uh, the, per the performance of the stock will be or how credible that the investors will look at into this new strategy by the management. And of course, we are also looking at the board uh, coming up with a new strategy from 2021 to 2025. So that will be looked at in that context. So those are my few thoughts, uh, just to piggyback or not Kevin had said. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen. I think Kevin, in the interest of time, since we have just 20 more minutes, we could proceed with the presentation and the additional questions that have been raised we'll tackle at the end. All right, so maybe the next thing we can talk about and just uh, uh, came in this morning, maybe Churchill will talk about NMG and talk about Liberty as we are just talking about insurance companies now. So we saw news from Liberty that um, they want to add some share, uh, to buy some shares back. So Liberty, as we know it, um, is constituted and has two subsidiaries. So there's uh, Liberty Life that predominantly handles life insurance and there's Heritage Insurance Kenya that again, um, uh, predominantly does the general insurance uh, business in Kenya. Heritage Insurance Kenya has a subsidiary in Tanzania. So it's called Heritage Insurance Company Tanzania or HIT. Uh, and it holds, I think 60% of that subsidiary also uh, Heritage Insurance Company in Tanzania underwrites general insurance. Uh, I've read or I've seen from uh, the little analysis I've done on, on insurance companies is uh, life predominantly tends to be the most uh, lucrative or uh, profitable 
uh, insurance line. Gen general tends to uh, really have some crazy, crazy overheads and doesn't uh, really add uh, or carry its weight when it comes to the bottom line. So we've seen Liberty uh, wanting to buy around 9% back, I think, I believe. Uh, that's 5% and 4% on two different vehicles. So we're going to see details as to how that's going to happen. But that was the news recently this morning that they're going to be buying uh, some of these shares back. Churchill, maybe you can touch on uh, NMG and capacity as we proceed. Oh, thanks, and uh, I think there's a question uh, sticking to that uh, on the on the Q and A section about NMG, whereby that was last week. It announced that uh, it's looking at uh, share buyback of up to ten percent uh, of its shares. Its shares was around uh, two hundred million shares that are, are outstanding. So looking at close to 90, 20, 20 million shares that will be bought from uh, this uh, proposed uh, share buyback. The details are still there because uh, one uh, or rather the the purpose of buying back the shares is at least to um, uh, in, uh, in a way is to prop up the share. So that's what it's seen even from the international markets, the people who buy back their shares. And I think in parentheses, I don't know whether Kevin, you, 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 you had a chance of looking at Warren Buffett's uh, uh, share uh, letter to the shareholders that came out over the weekend, and he talked about even the share buyback, uh, whereby he has a five percent share holding on uh, Apple. Uh, that is through his uh, his company. Uh, I, I forget the name. Uh, yes, so he has a five percent share holding, and because Apple has been uh, bought back its shares last year i think five percent of these shares just because it has that uh outsized uh cash flow so it's able to buy back shares uh, to the tune of five percent so automatically uh you find that uh even as a shareholder who still owns uh apple shares you find that your stake goes up by five percent by the virtue that uh, uh five percent of the shares has been removed from the total pool of the shares. So you find that even your net uh, percentage or your ownership stake in that company goes up by 5%. So that's the rationale. Uh, so here we are with NMG, we've seen that it's come off uh, even on a 52 week basis, it was not worth of 70 shillings per share. Right now it's really, really come off below 20 shillings per share. But we saw last week or rather after the announcement of that uh, share buyback, uh, the last two days, Thursday and Friday session, it went up by 20% on that on those two days, just based on the announcement of the share buyback. We still don't know the price that it will be bought at from, so there's still a cloud of uncertainty in regards to this particular transaction on M NMG. So that is still, uh, it, it will be assessed once further details come out uh, as a follow up to the announcement. Uh, so of course on the buyback, buyout uh, between Kabasid and BOC, we saw one of our competitors putting out, a, it had an independent valuation opinion uh, now to BOC shareholders in regards to whether that whole uh, buyout makes sense. Uh, here we're looking at uh, Kabasid, wants to buy uh, uh, buy wants to, to buy BOC at 63 shillings and 50 cents and uh, our competitor put out a note uh, advising the BOC shareholders that the fair value of it is around 94 uh, 94 shillings there about but it was an upside of it was the fair value of that report against the 63 shillings and 50 cents was around 44.5% a higher the fair value so it's like hey, you guys you're being uh it's being sold uh you're being sold at a discount at a steep discount so in a way it's just selling people perhaps you may need to rethink this whole transaction unless now capacity now marks up it's uh the price of buying the other shareholders uh significantly so that's the import of that independent valuation uh, reports but we'll see the results uh, i know that this uh, sale is still ongoing up until uh, early april and then you can see whether they'll be able to meet the thresholds that is required for that uh, uh, buyout to be successful yeah so yeah, 
Yeah. Maybe just to sum up what you've said in 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 a, in a one liner or a two liner is most of these companies will tend as, as he uh, greatly mentioned uh, Warren Buffett. Most of these companies will tend to buy shares back in the market when the prices are really not conducive. So the prices have really gone low. And the reason, there are a couple of reasons for this. So one is uh, they can buy the shares back from the market at low prices. And eventually in the future, when the company is doing a bit better and they need a new equity, they can reissue uh, some of these uh, shares that they bought back. The other reason they do this is to show confidence in the company. So. Uh, we've seen NMG has over the years uh, really underperformed. Uh, we've seen what's happened to uh, the news media, the print media. Uh, we've now seen them trying to uh, rejuvenate themselves and offering online uh, uh, platforms where you can subscribe. Uh, so yes, there are a couple of things they're doing, but media is not, uh, information right now is not being absorbed how it was absorbed say a decade ago. And most of these companies are having to really reinvent themselves. So. Uh, share buyback uh, through the Nairobi Securities Exchange is more or less a way for the company to show that, yes, we still have confidence in, uh, in our company. We know where we are headed and uh, we are firmly uh, attached to that. So we are going to move on to our next slide. And a couple of you guys might be thinking, we really covered on equities. We've really uh, talked about the individual stocks. Yes, we do have a Genghis fixed income model portfolio. I think you can see that on your screen. Uh, on your screen. And under this, we still have three portfolios as well. We have the core or the income bonds. We have the aggressive uh, income bonds and we have the trading bonds. So we are looking at the first one, uh, the core of the income bonds. We have two papers that we're looking at and that's the FXT3 2019 five, uh, whose duration or the modified duration, as you can see where my screen cursor is, is around 3.29 years. Uh, we have uh, the FXT1 2018 five. So again, predominantly this is the first paper issued in 2018, that's a five-year paper. But now we're in 2021, so that goes down to around 1.87 uh, years. So Churchill will talk to us how we look at um, uh, the coin income bonds, and maybe I can talk about uh, the rest as we move on, Churchill. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks for uh, taking at, at, at least uh, the initial steps of the Genghis fixed income model portfolio. So in the core income, uh, the first portfolio, primarily you are looking at uh, short term papers, uh, whereby the maturity is uh, five years and below. So you're looking at uh, papers whose now that in 2021, at least is at, it's, it's within a maturity of year 2026, so five years and below, so ideally. And uh, uh, coupons may not be as decent as what you're seeing in the aggressive income bonds, but uh, the issue that Kevin has talked about, modified duration, just to simplify it for the people in the call, this uh, is, is a measure of the risk sensitivity of a bond. So ideally, right now, holding everything as it is, say, uh, the yield on, say, FXD3 2019 five is at, say, hypothetically, is at 10%. And in the event that it goes up to, say, 11%, so that's a 1% increase. So the modified duration simply means that the, the pricing of the bond will go down by 3.29%. So that's the risk sensitivity. For every one percent increase in in yields, uh, what is the what is the respective decrease in 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 the in the name in, in in the in the bond price? And the reverse is true. For every one percent decrease in the yield, what is roughly the bond price? How will it go? Because at the bottom line is that. There's usually an inverse relationship between the yields and the bond price. So if yields go down, bond price goes up. If yields go up, bond price goes down. So ideally, that's what the modified duration means. So if I may just narrow down to the chair. Yeah. So maybe just to cut you on as you are still on the same point, and you've uh, rightly brought it out towards the end is, Yes, yields have an inverse relationship to price. So once a yield goes up, say by 1%, the price goes down. That's how it works on bonds, unlike with uh, other asset classes. And maybe Churchill, as you're talking, you might also want to tell us what's the relationship between the long, uh, we know we have our curve. Uh, so what's the relationship between the long end and the short end in terms of interest, and, uh, interest rate sensi sensitivity? 
Um, ideally, Which end is uh, most likely? Go on. Yes, Sorry. Ideally, uh, ideally is if you have longer papers or you have a bond which has a longer time frame to mature, say you have two bonds. So one is maturing in two years time, another one is maturing in 20 years time. So you look at the risk sensitivity of maturing in 20 years time is higher than the one which is maturing in two years time. And it's actually seen uh, from, uh, uh, even from uh, our examples, if you look at that uh, on the aggressive income bond, the second bond, the FXD1 2016-20, you see its modified duration is 6.33 years, uh, 6.33. Yeah. And if I compare with the core income bond, the second one, FXD1 2018-5, which is now, or oh, you go to the second slide, which is around 1.69%. So that is telling you that the longer the bond that you have, the riskier it is because uh, the, the thinking is that you don't know what will happen 20 years time as you hold that bond, as opposed to two years. You might have some, uh, some an idea what will happen in two years time. Uh, even if you look at it in the local market, you know that next year there's elections, after that people start rebounding. And even in against the fiscal policy, you can actually see that there are some uh, uh, projections that have been put out for the next three years, but as opposed to 20 years. So that's the thinking around it. And it also reflected even in the risk sensitivity of bonds. I hope I have clarified. You, you have, and I think uh, whatever is not clear, it's going to be asked on the question. So I guess under the aggressive income bonds, uh, predominantly we look at the coupon. And as you can see, I think it has the highest coupon of the three. So uh, again, our FXD1 2008, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe one yeah. thing we didn't mention is there are two kinds of bonds, or rather there are three kinds of bonds. One is not so popular. So we have uh, the fixed coupon bonds, and that's what you can see here under the core and under, under, under the aggressive. But then if you look at the trading bonds and the last two of them, you're going to see it's an IFP1, IFB1 and it's um, it's different from the FXD. So FXD just means fixed coupon uh, bonds. IFB are infrastructure bonds. So these are the bonds the government will issue when they want to build a bridge, a road, uh, etc. We also have something else that will say uh, called the savings and development bond. I think there's only one issued and it's the longest paper. It was a 30 year paper. Currently, I think it read, uh, it's, it's a 22, 23 year paper. So, but the most, 23 years. The most uh, common bonds you're going to see are the FXD, which means it's a fixed coupon, and you're going to see the IFBs. FBs are generally more uh, liquid, and I think uh, that predominantly brings them to why they are under classified under the trading bonds. They're more liquid, uh, they're loved by both locals and foreigners, and of course the attractiveness to, the, uh, to these kinds of bonds is they are tax exempt. So for all bonds between one year and 10 years, you're going, all bonds between one year and 10 years, you pay, I think, 15% uh, in tax, uh, withholding tax. For any bond about 10 years, all the way to now, all this, which I think is 23, you pay a 10% uh, tax rate. So for the IFBs, they are tax free or tax exempt, so you don't and, uh, get to pay uh, taxes on them. But then the flip side to that is there are fewer than the FXD. So every month, a government will issue one or two uh, FXDs, those are the fixed coupon bonds. Uh, but you'll realize over the last several years from history is that we've only had one or two FBs that are considered a Christmas gift by the government. So again, aggressive income bonds, we look at the coupon, the higher the coupon, the better you can see you have 13.75, 14%. Uh, if you look at the trading bonds, as I mentioned, is we look at the most liquid papers in the market. I don't think, Churchill, you have anything to add on those or we can go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So, Churchill, maybe you can take us through this and then see most of it will be a repeat of uh, maybe what you've said so quickly as a summary or a highlight. Yeah, so just this is now the year to date performance on our Jengis fixed income model portfolio. Uh, so, for the individual bonds, uh, the, the third last column that's the total yield year to the performance that's telling us what each individual bond has so far returned so just to go down to the in our portfolio we have a, a 
cash at the moment is around 3.7 percent and then the bond portfolio is 96.3 percent so that's the breakdown and then you see that uh, for the bond portfolio the total year-to-date performance is at 2.07 percent but because it has a 96.3 percent uh weighting on the portfolio so the overall portfolio is two percent as at yesterday this is now as at yesterday two percent and comparing with the benchmark which is the FTSE nsc kenya bond index which is 1.26 percent at least this portfolio has had a, a, a sterling run into the year at two percent so it's 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 above the index as it is. Uh, so for the the riskiness of the bond portfolio for every 1% increase in the yield across all the bonds in our portfolio, we are seeing that uh, the bond price will go down 3.35%. Uh, so your return will be down by 3% uh, so for every 1% increase in, uh, in yields. And the reverse is also true. For every 1% reduction in yields, uh, your portfolio will go up by 3%. So ideally, that's it. So for the overall portfolio, we're seeing a 3.2% uh, increase in your portfolio. Should there be a 1% decrease in yields? So ideally, that's the import of this slide. Uh, so yeah, so back to you, Kevin. All right, so maybe I think uh, our last slide is on the yield curve. So again, I remember there's a time I was trying to draw the yield curve and you're yeah. trying to explain to, to people the relationship between interest rates, uh, increase or decrease on the long end and the short end. So basically uh, how we model or how the yield curve is modeled is from the shortest uh, tenure to the longest tenure. And I can, as you can see here, we have uh, treasury bills just for um, everyone's sake, treasury bills are the uh, shorter dated uh, uh, government loans. So when the government wants money, uh, uh, three months money, they come to the market, we call them uh, a, a 91 day T-bill or a three months T-bill. We have one 82 day, which is essentially six months uh, T-bill, and we have 364 day, which is one year T-bill. So from there, then we just get on to bonds. So bills, shorter ends, bonds, longer term. As you can see on our uh, yield curve is, we have bonds now from two years all the way to 23 years, which I think is the uh, savings and development bond. And this is the price or the, or the rate at which those uh, the, the bonds under, under, under our market are trading at. So you can see this is a comparison between, uh, uh, this is a near-on-year -near comparison. So you can see the maroon line here is as of 20th Feb 2020, while the gray one is as, uh, just a few days ago, 20th of 2021. So it's easy to see over the short to midterm uh, period of this yield curve, and this is predominantly this part, the rates have really uh, come off compared to where the rates were last year. And Churchill, uh, a few minutes ago, explained uh, what exactly usually happens when the rates go down in terms of the inverse relationship between prices and yields. So yield go up, prices come off, uh, yields go down. It's a good thing for investors, prices go up. Chachil, anything to uh, summarize on that? Yeah, for sure. This is a uh, is is uh, it's an emerging theme, even across the globe. Uh, if some of the people on the call have been listening to the international business, this this uh, risk or perceived risk, uh, or rather the impact of global yields going up. So that is the dominant theme uh, from the global investment landscape. And uh, for sure enough, it just speaks to what you've been talking about. If yields go up, it means that the price of your bond goes down. Uh, so ideally, that's it. So I think you've covered uh, broadly what we wanted to speak about. But just looking at the short end of the curve, anything, if your bond is seven years and below to the T-bills, comparing to the same uh, level last year, you find that your yield has gone down. But of course, there are different cross currents if you look at it, because uh, between last year up until July, they about uh, yields were really on a decline uh, just because of the uh, what, what was happening in the COVID-19 situation in the country and across the globe. And uh, people now trooped into the uh, bond segment or the fixed income segment. And because of that, 
yields came down. So that is what happened from February last year up until July. But then from that, because of even what even happened in the country, partial reopening of the economy, uh, so we, or some semblance of normalcy uh, coming into the economy uh, from July thereabouts, we've seen that yields have gradually started going up, but still not to the level that they were a year ago. So this is also something important to, to work out. But in the uh, short term, uh, this is how the yield curve is sitting at. We can even get into, say, the five year and look at how it has been, say, from 2020, 2016, up to now. You can even look at it, rather than looking at it, comparing with other channels of the yield curve, you can even look at a spot tenor of the yield curve and do some comparison just to look at the trends on the yield of say five year or even the 10 year, which is considered the benchmark rate. Thank you, Churchill. And uh, I think uh, for anyone who yield curve is still not clear, they can always catch up every week on our, uh, on our weekly chats where we tend to uh, dissect and go deep into it. And some of the people might actually be surprised because uh, I think just this week or last week we saw yields from uh, uh, from German lenders, and uh, for sure the yields were in negative. And people would ask themselves, why would anyone give money and uh, say to a bank or to the government, uh, and I have to pay them for uh, safekeeping? So maybe we can get onto that in our weekly chats. You're always welcome, and I think Damaris does a good job to make sure those invites are out on time. So Damaris, thank you so much. Um... This has been great, by the way. So thank you, Kevin and Churchill. I know Friday 11 to 12 is a big ask and we really appreciate you for walking us through this. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Eunice had sent a question in the Q&A section about the nation buyback, but I believe Churchill, when you were talking about it, you comprehensively covered it. Eunice, if you have any lingering questions, please reach out to us. We are on all social media platforms. Churchill and Kevin are an email away on research at jengis-capital.com. Kevin, I've seen you stop sharing the screen, okay. but Ben, Ben had a question in the model portfolio. So Ben, if I scroll up in the chats, he asked on the price list, could you explain to him the meaning of the changes and percentages that we've seen? I know you've explained it, but maybe you could just add, add, do a quick run through in the changes, uh, I believe, year to date, if I'm not wrong, that was slide number three. Uh, as you find the right, yes, Kevin. Sorry, oh, I didn't get the question, but I believe Churchill got it. Maybe he'll handle it. I've brought back the screen. Not sure if you're able to see it. Yes, we're able to see it. So I'd like you to go to the Jengis model portfolios, the year-to-date comparison. I think it was the third. The, yes. yes, this one. So I believe Ben is asking about the changes and the percentage uh, percentages you indicated here. Because on the first slide, I believe equity was one price. On this side, equity is a different price. The same for all the different counters. Okay. So, Chacho. So, oh, okay. okay. Chacho? Sorry, Kevin. Kevin. Then you, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, as I would mention, the first, uh, so what you're seeing on screen now are the prices as, as and when we were coming up with the Genghis plate. And that was earlier on in the year. So, you can see, for instance, 36.1 uh, on equity and when you go to the next slide we have it at that 7.85 so these prices you're seeing in green and red so green basically shows it's gone up from uh where where we were uh towards the beginning of the year when we we're launching the playbook so equity is on green so as you can see it's at 7.85 earlier we had it at 36.1 if you look at kcb for instance early in the year we had 38.5 if you look at it now we have the 7.95 so it means a decline and that's why we code it in red so these, these prices here are as at close of business yesterday. Uh, these prices here are as and when we were putting together the playbook. I hope that's clear. It's crystal clear. Thank you so much, Kevin. <laughs> uh, Thomas is asking a question about the safest government bonds to bet on, long-term or short-term ones. Um, who wants to tackle this one? Um, I can attempt and Churchill can wind up. <laughs> so when you're talking about bonds and uh, this is a very common and uh, important question is uh, I've had guys talking about safety 
And one thing I can, uh, I'd like to tell all our clients is in terms of safety, government is the safest uh, uh, bet you can place. So uh, if our government was going to say collapse or was going to go into civil law and such things, most of your banks will have already seized operations, you know, so they will have already fallen apart. Your circle deposits will have already fallen fast. Everything else will have crumbled before we get to, to the government. Because the government, remember, the last resort, they could always print money. They could do increased taxes. They could do whatever they want uh, just to, 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 uh, to continue operating. So in terms of um, which are the safest government bonds, all government bonds are safe. Of course, you can look at it uh, from a personal level in terms of uh, duration. You could say, you know, I have certainty that, for instance, we, are, we Kenya is a five-year cyclical nation, so every five years we get onto a general election. So as, as as Kevin, I could decide, you know, I want only bonds that are five years or less. I don't want my uncertainty to close to the next government if anything happens. And we saw what happened in 2007 and 2013 and the post-election violence. So at, at a personal uh, level, I could say I want a five-year or less because I feel it's safe. I'm safer there. Uh, someone else could decide, you know, I don't really care. I can lock the rates now because I don't know what will happen uh, with the rates 10 years from now. So I'm safer taking a 20 year. And we've seen insurance companies going for the longer end, yeah. Uh, we've seen banks trying to balance, of course, the short end and longer end, of course, also to match their liabilities. But uh, in terms of safety, bonds are safe. Um, in terms of uh, talking about safety in duration, maybe Churchill has a different opinion, Churchill. Yeah, you put it. Uh put you actually took words from my mouth i would have said it the same way and uh, of course if you look at the nsc bond list naturally are there the government bonds we also have the corporate bonds but corporate bonds is there's been a lack of robust activity in corporate bonds uh, primarily due to the fact of there are some curveballs or there are some uncertainties that you've seen even in the current in the recent history within the corporate bond segment. So this is just magnifying what Kevin has said, that rather look at, uh, look, you look at it, you are safe uh, betting with the government, rather putting money with the government, as opposed to the corporates, because of the, there are some underlying or structural weaknesses with corporate bonds that you may not even find uh, in the government security space. So, but now the, is entirely upon you. Whether you want to be short term or whether you want to go long term, it's entirely upon you. You can get into long term for the income because the rationale is if I look at a 15 year bond, for instance, as compared to a five year bond, the 15 bond, 15 year, so that's one. And also the withholding tax. Uh, so, for instance, that 15 year paper has a coupon rate of 10% uh, coupon rate and it gives you coupons every six months, semi-annual coupons. So at 10%, so what you'll get, you'll, you'll receive 9%. Uh, that is the income that the net proceeds will get every six months, 9% for every 100 you invest into. So, but as compared to a uh, five year, which already perhaps is giving you a coupon rate of 8% and the withholding tax is 15%. So, uh, it deducts that's around 1.2% uh, uh, there about. So you get that you receive 6.8% from a fire. But math is actually upon you. You can either look at it uh, for just, uh, I don't mind the return. I just want to go to a short term paper or a long term paper. So those duration is entirely upon you. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for that clarification. And uh, Thomas, I hope it's been useful. Uh, I'd like just to say that the weekly chats that Kevin referred to, are the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefings, that's every Monday, 9 to 10 a.m. The link to register I've shared on the chat option. So if you'd like to have a continuous conversation and learn more about these different concepts and different terminologies and different ways of analyzing uh, investment opportunities, please feel free to join us. I'd also like to say that the recording of this entire webinar will be posted on the Jengis YouTube channel. So in case you missed any part or you joined late or you want to re-listen to a certain section, uh, the video will be uploaded, then you'll be able to view at your own pleasure. 
Now, as we wind up, David has sent a couple of more questions. His first one was uh, our view on EABL. Do we see the share, the share price rising? And by what percentage are you able to, to compute this? Uh, we, on EABL, we have a target price of uh, 194. 194. Uh, right now it's at 167 uh, EABL. And primarily we are looking at it uh, on the reopening of the economy. Uh, basically, ideally second half for last year, rather, sorry, the second half for EABL's earnings that between January to June was uh, dampened by the effect of uh, closure of bars and uh, social events being curbed. Uh, but in the first half period, uh, that's between July up until December for the current EABL financial year, we saw that there was that bounce back. And that just uh, leads credence to the fact that uh, those measures were somehow uh, reduced, yet uh, we are still not yet back to normal, uh, but at least uh, the impact in the second half, in the second quarter of last year, uh, weighted off from just looking at the uh, EABL's uh, financials for between July to, to, to December. Uh, right now, I know that uh, the next announcement should be due uh, between now up until next week uh, at 12th by the president does telling us whether the curfew will be entirely eliminated or the forms of the containment measures, whether they'll still be as they are. But the outlook that you're looking at EABL is eventually that this will this uh, kind of measure will be lifted. Right now we have the uh, vaccine that have come to the country, which Damaris has already received the vaccine, the first one at Jenge. So we are seeing that it will be a boost to uh, even uh, EABL or uh, reopening of the economy and also the lifting of these measures for EABL. So that is the, the outlook that we are seeing on the company and it will be able to support even the, the fundamentals or the outlook of the company and hence our target price at 194 shillings. Back to you, Damaris, or Kevin might chime in. I don't know whether Kevin has some views or back to you, Damaris. Well said, well said. Damaris? Uh, okay, I'd really like us to wind up now because we are 15, 15 minutes past our, our ending time and I know people have lots of things to do. So I'm probably just going to ask two really quick questions that we could answer in brief. David wants to understand what fundamentals are. So Churchill and Kevin, you're probably guilty of this crime of using this term fundamentals. What does it mean? And then lastly, Anderson is asking, perhaps you could just concisely mention the key shares that you'd recommend for the long-term investment. Anderson, what I'd like to also say is that even if you joined late, the video will be posted to the Jengas YouTube channel so you'll be able to view the entire recording at your pleasure so gentlemen a minute each of those questions who wants to go first Churchill this time can go first <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, just to put it at a more uh, the basics our fundamentals is uh, the drivers of uh, say the company what do you think uh, are the drivers for the company. So on the broad perspective, you look at it, what are the drivers that could be able to uh, support the revenue on one side? So the discussion will be what measures the company might put in place to support the revenue or uh, whether there could be some regulatory uh, developments that could either dampen the revenue prospects of the company or increase the prospects of the company or whether the sector what dynamic is happening in the sector that you can see will be positive uh, for the company's revenue so on that perspective so there's the revenue side and also the cost side how will the company be able to reduce the cost from a company perspective or from an industry perspective or what 
what are the measures that uh, the company will do. So at it, I look at the drivers and it boils down to two things, revenue, increase of revenue or reduction in costs. So the, the rest are details. So collectively, all that we call uh, fundamentals uh, of the company. Uh, I don't know whether Kevin has some views on that, but in my view, just to blame for layman's, that's how I'll, 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 uh, I'll pigeonhole fundamentals to be. Thank you so much, Hachel. So maybe Kevin, in conclusion, you could just give us uh, an answer to Anderson's question. I mean, he also stole the words from my mouth, just basically to answer it maybe in, in a different way, is when you're talking about fundamentals, we're looking at uh, the company, so which sector the company is in. So if you're looking at, say, Safaricom, you're going to look at uh, uh, the sector. So we have Airtel money, we have uh, Orange money. So if you're going to look at Safaricom, you also have to look at what happens to these other telco companies. Then you have to look at the company composition in terms of uh, management, uh, how uh, equipped or, you know, is it a solid management? Then, of course, you have to look at um, going again deeper down is the market they want to uh, the market they're set up for, you know, how is the market, how is the market dynamics, as Churchill mentioned. Then, of course, there's regulatory, you know, we have uh, Ministry of Environment telling EBL, don't throw your waste into where, blah, blah, blah. We have uh, government, which always in terms of uh, during the budget, when they want to, uh, to increase more revenue, they're always increasing the excess uh, taxable to, you know, BAT, EABL. So there's always been that uh, regulatory risk. So just fundamentals are all those things now just put together. And as Churchill alluded to, is either to look if the costs are going down or the revenue is going up, the rest are details. <laughs> okay, Kevin. So who's going to give us just a list of key shares for us to look at as long-term investments? We talked about the momentum, uh, the, the different portfolio, model portfolio, maybe the, the, the client missed, uh, but he's lucky he's going to watch it on YouTube. But uh, it all depends on what exactly, the, one of the things we look forward to is determining what exactly the client is in for. So we look at his risk appetite, we look at uh, what exactly he wants to achieve, is it capital preservation, is it to increase by X amount. So there are all those metrics that we use to analyze each uh, um, individual client. But then again, we have those uh, basic uh, uh, model portfolios that we have, and you can see we have the momentum, we have the income, where we really look at uh, high dividend uh, stocks. We have uh, value stocks. You know, these are your easy to get and easy to get out stocks. So, uh, top of the list, I always say is always put your money in blue chips. And most of these companies you can see here is we have them uh, as blue chips. So you have Safaricom, of course, the biggest uh, company, bigger than all the other companies combined at 56%. We have, of course, your top banks, KCB, Equity, EBL, NCBA, Stanchart, uh, all the liquid and blue chip companies. So these are uh, uh, stocks, I would say, uh, we really look at them long term. And we didn't just start looking at modern portfolio yesterday. It's something we have done uh, concurrently over the years. So in a nutshell. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you, Churchill, again, for this insightful uh, discussion. This is the Genghis Monthly Financial Chats. We'll be having it monthly, as you would guess. So we hope you'll join us for the next edition, which will be in April. Meanwhile, every week on Mondays between 9 and 10, we have the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing, which gives you insights for the week ahead when it comes to equities, fixed income, and the global financial markets. There is a short survey at the end of this webinar. We really love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much for making the time and for your kind remarks. So talk to you soon and have an awesome weekend. Goodbye.